Askawi Kwasanumis ni Tampuag, Kanupiam, Natasawis Crystal Baker, Education Coordinator of the Tamaquag Museum. And it is my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the sixth presentation in our year long Culture Bearer series. Throughout this series, we are introducing you to Indigenous educators who have been vital to the work of sharing and preserving cultural knowledge. This series was made possible thanks to the funding from the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, the Pepito Opportunity Connection, the New England Foundation for the Arts, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, Rhode Island Charge, other anonymous funders, and many community donors. If you too would like to support programs like this one or other Tomaquag educational endeavors, please visit our website at tomaquagmuseum.org. And please know that we appreciate your support. A few housekeeping tips. Please make sure that you are on mute in order to avoid background noises. However, you may engage throughout the presentation by using the chat box to type in your thoughts and use your reaction buttons to let us see your enthusiasm. We will also have time to take a few questions at the end of the presentation. If you encounter any technical trouble, please use the chat box to private message Tomaquag Tech for assistance. And now it is my honor to introduce you to Ramona Peters as this month's culture bearer. Ramona's traditional name is Nosapakit, and she is a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribal Nation. She is an internationally renowned educator, published author, and indigenous activist, supporting tribal communities all across Turtle Island. As a community organizer, she has brought tribal communities together for cultural sharing, historical preservation, repatriation efforts, and conservation advocacy. Ramona Peters holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona in elementary education and a master's degree in applied human and community development from the California School of Professional Psychology. This is just a highlight of her years of work and dedicated service to her culture, community, and others. So please join me in welcoming today's guest, Ramona Peters. Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you, Crystal. Um, I think she mentioned that I was from Mashpee, I'm a Wampanoag, and my family is Bear Clan. And I am in Mashpee right now at my living room slash studio. So um, welcome to my place. Um, I'm working on a piece, so if I while I'm speaking, um, if I look down, it's only because uh, there's a wet piece of clay in front of me and it may take a little attention, a little water every once in a while just to keep it in progress. So I've been doing pottery for about, I tried to calculate it, but I think it's about 35, 40 years, 35 somewhere. But uh, it's not about the time so much as the, the feel of it. Um, working with the earth directly is an honor and a privilege to have the earth actually speak to me through my hands. It's, it's an awesome experience and maybe some of you have also had that experience. Uh, I, I love doing it. Um, I didn't always though I actually did not realize that clay should be a part of my life until you now like about 35 years ago someone asked me to make a piece and I in the process of making it um, an entire oh, shift took place in my my body and it was um, just what I needed at that point in my life and ever since so uh, clay the earth um, and so I've learned a lot about it, and I've learned a lot about our, our ancestors as well through, through the earth directly. I think all indigenous people realize that the DNA of their ancestors is in the earth, um, wherever they live, and uh, it, it tends to seep out um, in 
and through uh, the land. I was able to look at some pieces of pottery that were broken, found through archaeology and accidental discovery by people in a neighborhood or wherever. They, these pieces of pottery would show up every once in a while, especially after it rains, they sort of percolate up a little bit. And so there were pieces found and I used those to figure out how to make impressions on the clay. And some of it was dragging. Um, some tools were, and I've made a bunch of tools and I, if I, I'm going to try and get some of them closer to the camera for you, but so some, just to demonstration, some, some are actually dragged across the clay to make lines or um, uh, curvy. Some are used to, now this, this is a tool that is used to rock on the clay. And so these, the, these will leave a series of dots, this particular one. Um, then, uh, well, geez, I, I have a number of them. I'm not gonna go through all of them because there's, there's, there's many. And because I got inspired by the idea of some of the pieces I found, uh, the shirts, the, the, the impressions were impossible to duplicate without making these tools. And so I found out that certain woods um, really work well with the clay. Um, there was a time in my life that I worked in a boatyard, and so I had access to a lot of exotic woods, which I did try some, and uh, from different parts of the world. And um, so I was lucky there. Some wood actually takes a carve better than others. Um, I use antler uh, from deer and, and also bone. That they this also works well with with clay. Um, there's a fellow in the tribe that made me a few nice pieces that I could use to sketch um, easily onto the clay. Uh, I use um, whalebone, um, one of my favorite piece uh, tools to for smoothing and especially around the base of the the piece, uh, it needs a lot of connection. You're always connecting the rows. These are coil constructed pots. And so there's one coil on top of another and they, they need to have a memory, a collective memory between them in order for them to survive um, heating and cooling and staying together. So smoothing and sometimes I sing to them <laughs> because uh, the tapping on them with paddles also sends a vibration that also uh, connects them. So I've made a bunch of paddles too. Um, this one, you might see uh, there's, it was a kitchen tool and I carved some star prints through the holes and it also has an edge so I can rock the design onto the the piece as well. And on the other side, there's another type of star, like a shooting star pattern in there. Uh, most ancient type of paddle is the coil wrapped paddle. And these, uh, this hemp, uh, it, it, you can soak it in the water. It's a mahogany stick, so it really, mahogany seems to love water. Um, and so the two, the two combined together and leave a very old style uh, pattern that you can shift it so it doesn't look like just lines, but also hatch, hatching. Uh, uh, this panel you can see is sort of carved so that it, it can, I got carried away with this one. This one has, um, teeth that go up like this in rows. And when I paddle the piece, I can pull clay up. Sometimes the shape, uh, it depends on the clay too. Some of the clays are um, easier to work with 
meaning some of them are really uh, love to be shaped and others need a little bit more attention uh, to get them in, um, into balance. And so this paddle is really a persuader. <laughs> oh, I just show you if I can get a close enough so you can see. Uh, it broke once and so I had to make like a, a Dutchman, what they call from the boat, yeah, this technique of you know, mending wood splits. Um, so there's that. My uh, grandchildren are here and they've been here for a month. And uh, I'm so happy, it was so much fun. Um, and one of them, uh, Ever, made some impressions from my tools on a piece of clay. And I'm just going to show you close up to the number of different types of patterns that some of my tools can make. Uh, so that, that was, is fun. I will fire that for him uh, when I finish this piece I'm working on here. Uh, so I actually have some slides of some pottery um, that I've done in the past. So I'm going to try and share that with you right now. Um, <clears throat> And uh, just, I'm believing that it's there on the screen. Yes, okay. So uh, this is one of my earlier pieces and I kept this in the family, actually. You might even be able to see it in the background over there in the corner. Uh, it's very thin and delicate in a way, but it's huge. Um, a couple gallons maybe uh, could fit in there. Uh, these are cooking pots, old time cooking pots, and most of them, that's, that's what I, I really like to do, make, is the cooking pot. Uh, it means a lot about communal lifestyle um, and, oh gosh, there's a lot uh, to, to share about this. So I'm just going to try and scroll through. Um, as you can see, I really like to carve on the pots as well as leave impressions. And so sometimes they take a lot of different forms. And we didn't use a lot of color, our, our glazes, if you would. But black, uh, red ochre. Sometimes I mix white clay into, or I actually do inlaid white clay. Um, this piece I called Ancient Lately, and I totally got carried away with this piece. I even started to make impressions and carvings on the inside of it, you can see inside the rim there. Uh, and, and the sizes are hard to imagine. Um, that piece stands about, 20 inches tall. And, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe 12 or so wide, uh, a foot wide. This is what a, an older form, an earlier piece. Uh, we call these clay sacks, but this one doesn't really look like a sack. And I, I was a perfectionist back in those days didn't realize that we are not perfect and we should accept that. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I got really carried away about making very straight sides and um, it was fun and it was an accomplishment. Uh, so there it is. Um, I call this uh, the Oreo pod, sort of reminiscent of the, the bird's nest Oreos. This one is inspired by the Southwest, actually. Um, one of my uh, schoolmates when I was in the University of Arizona, her grandmother was uh, from San Alfonso. And I got to visit uh, Pueblo people. And even though it's, so, it's, uh, it's our north, Northeastern style shape, um, the colors are very much reminiscent of the Southwest. This is a uh, whale oil pot. Now we used whale oil um, for a lot of things. Um, and so this clay, it, this clay comes from the 
the next town over uh, are in Barstable, a couple of towns down. And the clay is very red. They used to have a brick making factory over there. It was a huge deposit of this kind of clay there. Um, not a lot now, but you know, you can see there's thousands and millions of bricks all over the place. And it, it comes from the earth directly. Uh, this is another whale inspired piece. Uh, you know, living on Cape Cod and Cape Cod Bay, we have the whales visit us every year and they're in the bay right now. Uh, the grandchildren went out yesterday, the day before yesterday in a whale watch and saw four of them um, on facts. Uh, this, these are vertebrae, they're whale vertebrae. Um, I call this the vineyard sound piece. This is all uh, white clay and inlaid. My friend Berta uh, Welch over in the vineyard, she's a, a critter. She did the, in, the waffle inlay for me. It was a collaborative piece and we we put it in an exhibit over at uh, Mashon Tucket Pequot. Actually won a prize uh, in that piece. Very small, but very sweet. Eh? Uh, this one is called the, uh, the Legend of Mashpee Pond. Uh, this piece is in the, the museum, Pequot Museum uh, purchased this piece. It's quite large. Um, a lot of people are angry with me because I let it go. The, uh, it, there's a story behind it and I, I don't know that I have enough time to talk about that. So I'm just gonna move along. Uh, this is uh, a canteen. Uh, I call them water buddies. It's a series. Um, the, the series I, you know, made made three of them, and this was the first one. And so it's a canteen uh, with a strap on it, and uh, you can't see the back of it, but it has like some loops to hold the strap and some glyphs of uh, our local relatives. And so I got into the, uh, this is uh, this is almost, it's very similar to a pot that we found in archeology span and it is a, you know, a whole lot. <laughs> um, yeah, this this one is, uh, is one of my favorites. I do not remember where it went to. Uh, and none of these did I keep for myself. Uh, except for the, the, the first one you saw. Another uh, bird pot, I called it like bird in the apron. Um, there was a moment in my time where I worked, I did a course at the Radcliffe uh, Ceramics over in, uh, off of, in Harvard, whatever. Anyway, uh, you'll see some of those pictures of that class, but. In that school, in that ceramic center, they have kilns of all types, and so I got to protect, uh, practice, uh, do some of these types of firing techniques that I would not be able to do at home. Uh, it's great fun. Uh, another relative piece. These are lap bowls. I made a series of lap bowls that we would have. You know, had this is a very, very large piece as well. Um, I would say three gallons could uh, liquid or food could be in there. Another clay sack. And so this powdery color comes from the whatever is in the water, it comes through the clay when it's fired. Uh, you can't see the whole piece. I never, I didn't save a picture of this whole piece for some reason, but. Cape Cod pot. The pots along the coastline were more rounded on the heads than they were in the bodies. The, the inland, they start to get squarish up top. When the, it's an example of inlaid white clay, this piece here with the rim and pipes. Uh, I made some, some clay pipes as well. So, uh, lots and lots of work through the years, but uh, that's a taste of some of the things we've been doing. Um, 
And these are now some pieces that were found in archaeology, just so you can see some of that. And I'll just scroll through. It's very seldom that a whole piece will be found, but these are some. This one I think was reconstructed. Piece of shirt. And this piece I put in here uh, because it's pretty remarkable. This piece is actually comes from Japan. And I, I did a, a show, I used to do a lot of galleries with um, showings with my work. I started doing it that way. And anyway, I got picked up on it and asked to go to Japan and show my work in one particular gallery. And when I got there, people just, I brought six pots with me. They all sold um, for the first day. But the people just dropped to their 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 knees and said, squatted down there looking because of the display, and they remember this piece. This it was a whole period of time that was called the Oman period. I had no idea what it, what was happening, but the the similarity between our thoughts just shocked everybody. Um, and I, you know, it was fun to see and experience that. So this is, I'm just gonna scroll through um, some of the places where I get clay and uh, material a lot along this, these, the seashore uh, and the cliffs. There's a clay pounds down in uh, Wellfleet. Uh, it's part of the National Seashore and they've allowed me to take my class and other people in there to get some clay material. After we get it, you know, we have to do some crushing. Um, so we're using a mortar and pestle. Uh, yeah, that's me ages ago <laughs> uh, in the studio there at uh, the Harvard Studios. And uh, people are shift, sifting it out because there's, you know, there's rocks and other organic material that could be in the clay. Um, so we have to get clean it before we can use it. So there's a lot of that. It's a big process making uh, clay bodies. And then we need to test them in the kiln to find out when they would melt. So clay has a, a, a you know, a melting point. And so you don't want your pot to melt. So we find out through the testing what it can do and how far we can, how, how long we can cook it and at what temperature. This is an example of the coils, you know, you're making long, long coils. And then my technique is a little different than I think others, people that I've watched, uh, like people from the Pebbles. I do coil, roll out the coils, but I, I then paddle them to be a, the thickness that I, want my piece to be. So when I stack them, they are already close to the thickness I, I want. Um, so it just takes away um, a lot of guesswork. And um, so these are some of my students working on their pieces, paddling, shaping. And there's just a couple of other little tiny little pieces, little uh, pieces that I made. Um, I tossed in at the end of this thing. So there's that. Uh, I know I'm going along really quickly. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I would like you to have some time to ask some questions. But uh, before we do that, I'd like to share what I'm doing now. Now, I, I, I get to use plastic and other things, 
where I know the ancestors only had probably wet leather pieces to keep their clay in a, it takes quite a while to, to make a, a pot. Um, and most clay bodies will not stand up so that you could make the whole piece in one sitting, or, you know, eight hours or so, because it's too soft. You know, the weight of the water and the clay um, it determines really a lot of things. Uh, but so somehow I try to imagine, you know, that what the clay built, uh, the pot, pot makers were doing back in the day. Um, and I, the thing that I think they were doing was that they would wrap them or gently put um, thin, damp, uh, thin, damp uh, leather buckskin that had no hair on it. And I use a piece of buckskin to a wet one to, to smooth also. I call it the leather tongue. And it just sort of uh, licks it, picked the, all the little nudges out of the piece, right? Um, and then they probably put it in, uh, bury it, uh, not completely bury it, but put it in a, in a, a shallow hole just to keep it for, um, cooler. Because um, once it air, too much air will harden it, the sun, direct sunlight will crack it. Um, so. I'm just trying to guess what, how they how they manage some of the conditions that that clay uh, pottery building demands. Um, they definitely need shelter from the the wind and the sun, um, and may, maybe even the heat. I'm not sure about that. The humidity actually helps <laughs> slow the, the drying. So. Um, I'm now moving towards just doing commission pieces, so I I don't do galleries anymore. There's a lot of stuff. Um, the reason I did the galleries is just so that uh, people would see pottery from the Northeast. Uh, I guess I did uh, revive the form, the clay pot form. We hadn't, as far as I could tell, we haven't used these clay pots since around 1710. I found evidence of one family here in Nashby that still lived in the Wheatu and refused to um, acculturate or assimilate. And so they had the clay pots in their, in their uh, Wheatu. Although they did have a wood stove in there, we too. Um, but in any case, that thing, that's the last that um, I could trace any uses of them. Um, because people, they traded them for the metal, the copper, and other pots that the Europeans brought. They're, they're easier to transport. They're no more durable. Of course, the English and, the, and some of the Europeans were using lead, which wasn't a good idea to drink or use lead for anything that was going to hold water or anything else that you would drink. Uh, pewter is not good either, really bad. Um, but they were live and learn, right? So they, the, the copper, copper, uh, copper heats up really fast, but it's I don't know that it's that good for you, but yeah, what, yeah sorry, I'm going down the, down the rabbit hole here. Um, we traded off using these pots. And so the form disappeared. And I really didn't want to see that form disappear completely forever. And so going to the galleries instead of on the powwow grounds. So a lot of us as craftspeople, we, we display our finest work amongst our people at the powwow. Um, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. It's kind of risky when you're talking about pottery out there, but you know, a little bump at the table could, could cost a lot. Um, but I wanted to, you know, I wanted the art form of our ancestors to be respected by the art world. 
um, in the fine arts. In fact, my first show was at the Cape Cod Museum of Fine Arts and, then, and they let me show like 15 bots. And so it was wonderful. And a lot of native people came, filled the room. It was, it was great. I, I, it was totally encouraging for me uh, to continue doing this. Um, <clears throat> so after doing that for a while, um, and I thought that we were, it was established well in the art world that this is an art form. Um, and I started teaching, taught a lot of people, mostly and a lot of our own people. In the wintertime, I would take students and, um, and sometimes they would do it in Indian education, we called it the Title IV program. Um, so a lot of our folks have been introduced to it. Um, but it's, it's, it's a certain person, uh, certain types that really take to the clay. And uh, so it's not everybody, uh, and that's okay, that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let me, so what I'm working on right now, I got commissioned for a piece that's going back to, back to Harvard actually, the Divinity School commissioned a, uh, a piece for the Schwartz Hall, they call it. It's a building that has been renovated and um, the school is, uh, they want an indigenous presence there. Um, and for, for a number of years, I, I have been doing uh, guest lecture series, lecturing in um, Anne Brody's uh, Indigenous Studies you know, class or whatever. And, uh, you know, Anne's been a, a good friend too. And uh, she always invited Native people to come and do their presentations rather than her teaching a class. So I appreciate that about her. And also wanted local people to do the to be represented. So uh, in any case, uh, that particular school is a religious studies and they, they respect uh, the spirituality of our folks. And um, so I, I agreed to do this commission and um, I'm going to show you the piece that I made for that. It wasn't easy because I reared in Mashpee has have a not so great history um, uh, regarding land and missionaries and all of that. So, excuse me while I pick the piece up. Um, I'll try to move slowly so not to give people vertigo. <laughs> okay. So, so this is how it's going to sit in the display. It does have the rounded bottom. So you, um, I know something happened. So it couldn't stand on its own. And normally uh, people would have three rocks around three or four or something, you know, whatever mom, but rocks that would hold the pot above the coals. And you could bring the coals close around the pot to control the, the temperature of whatever you were cooking. So I did not want to make a flat bottom pot for just so that it would be easier to display. And then uh, the museum, uh, the uh, school had some issues or concern about the rocks. Um, that if the rocks took a little slide, that the pot would fall over, and you know all of that. So, so I came up with this as a solution. 
and making a stand to help it. Uh, yeah, so there. Um, and so you can see the uh, white inlay and uh, the black slip of the cloth. And it's, it's fine, and this is where it's going to go. Um, I think the bear is going to be black. And the other piece on the other side, there's three pieces um, that are holding this. Um, one of them is mixed with, I mis mixed up some white clay into, the, into it on the, the side. And the back piece is not really going to be seen much, but it has a bunch of stamps on it. Like my grandson's stamps, so like so, like petroglyphs. So I'm going to put this back and uh, open for questions. Oh, thank you. Ramona, can I hope everyone can hear me? Uh, that was absolutely amazing and beautiful. I have a newfound appreciation for um, pottery, but in particular the indigenous pottery. Thank you for sharing that history. Uh, very enriching, uh, and it just makes um, it makes it come much more alive. So, so thank you for preserving that through your work. Um, we are going to open up for some questions here in the chat. And if you bear with me, I'm not the techiest person. So, okay, here we go. Um, so some questions and comments coming through. So, so very beautiful. Thank you for giving of your time to share your work and so much knowledge with us today. It makes my heart so full. Um, and another person is saying, thank you for sharing your story. Um, if anyone does have a question and would like to unmute and ask that question, you may do so at this time, or you can type your question in the chat and I will ask for you. Uh, I have a question myself, Ramona. Sure. Um, I love the pictures of you gathering the clay. Mm -hmm. And I heard you mention shale mm. um, and the process of it. So it, I always thought the clay was just part of the dirt. Honestly, I thought there was dirt that was clay, but it's actually the substance shale pounded down. Would you explain a little bit of that? Right, it's it's a special vein of earth. You know, there's there's many layers. A clay got is sort of like it got finely sifted um, through a lot of motion of the earth itself, and compressed as well. Uh, the finer, the better. Um, there are different. There is such thing as stoneware, which is a little coarser, but. Um, it's usually um, around water bodies um, because that's where a lot of the shifting took place. And uh, okay, yeah. Oh, interesting. So um, I wouldn't be able to just go out in any lake or river and dig around and find a clay substance. It's particular. I noticed you were like near the shoreline that looked like the ocean. Um, Right, that was quite, there's a high cliff there. Um, and yes, yeah, so we had to rinse out a lot of the salt because if, uh, just from the spray, not from the ocean itself, but there's, mm -hmm. um, when that would fire, if I didn't rinse out the salt, when it fired, it would turn red. Mm -hmm. so salt uh, fires. Yeah. Um, we do crush rocks, though, just to be clear. I call them rotten rocks, and there's a soft rock. We, we crush those up, too, and mix them in with the clay. It helps make them 
durable. And mm-hmm. on the bottom of the piece, I use a lot of that durable stuff. Um, just because it's the part that sits on the rocks, right? So. Let's see, we do have a question coming through. Ramona, thank you so much for sharing your brilliant work and your knowledge with us. You said at the beginning that when you do this work, the earth is speaking to me through my hands. That's a quote. This is such a powerful teaching. And I wanted to ask if you could tell us all more about how we can learn from the earth, especially at a time when human induced climate change is taking a drastic toll on the planet. Thank you so much for this presentation today. So. Yeah, so thank you for that question. Mm-hmm. There's um, two things I would say about that. Yes, the clay, um, the clay already has um, it has a creative energy in it. It's a living thing. In fact, in our language, um, is the word. It it this is it's an animate because it is a living thing. The clay is a living thing, and so that when moving it and touching it, it actually has a creative direction. <laughs> and so the hands are just following along what that direction is. Mm-hmm. A lot of surprises come out, um, and I think if you got a piece of clay and you um, allowed it uh, just to offer its direction it would be it would be surprising what would happen um the earth i think uh some of that uh climate atrocity that we're experiencing um in order to feel the earth again you really almost need to clear away some of the debris around our heads and bodies um Luckily, those of us who are in the coastline, at least in Mashpee, we have a lot of um, crystal granite, uh, crystal, the, the beach sand. It, um, the beach sand, laying on it without the towel will help draw a lot of impurities out of your body and mind. Uh, it's a good, it's an old Indian trick. You uh, <laughs> get rid of some foolishness so that you can see a little clearer. Um, that's one way to do it. Uh, so I'll stop there with that. Thank you. Thank you for that response. A um, Couple of more coming through. We see a lot of incising and pressed pottery, but not too much painting for design in our traditional pots. In your opinion, why do you think that is? And in your research, have you seen painted pots done traditionally in the Northeast? If so, did they differ in design patterns? So there's three questions there. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, no, there's very little. um, I have seen, I have a piece uh, that was found that has, Again, it's just the black and the red ochre. Um, but its design is very simple. The painting is very simple. And I know it could be, we all know it could be very elaborate, but they're not. They're very, um, minimal, minimalist sort of. Uh, and I don't, I don't know why that is. Um, I do know that we were not a material culture. And so even though the pots, the pots are actually like members of the family. So that, that's where everybody came to get their food from. So they had a very special place in our family unit. And you'd think, and so the, the carving and the incising and all of that is, is particular to, to that family, I presume. Mm-hmm back in the day, but um, I don't know why uh, painting was not, um, I mean, it came in much later in history where we painted on leather and 
uh, we did use color in that our mats interior mats like beautiful patterns but and we did dye um, uh, fibers to make uh, rope and, sash and sashes and things like that so but I don't know why painting was not mm. one of our things um, and uh, another viewer, I, I was interested in hearing about the story that you carved into one of the pieces you showed in the slideshow presentation. So if there's time, she'd love to hear the story. Um, it's about 1245 and we have about 10 more minutes for questions. Okay. Um. Well, I, I guess I failed to mention that the, the body of the pots is considered female and the top of the pot is considered male. The bottom of the pot is where um, the nutrients, the, you know, the minerals and uh, all the elements uh, that go into the piece, the pot, uh, and the heat and everything water merge together and make medicine for us to eat, right? Um, so that's like mom or that's the female offering to the, the family unit. But on the top where you saw and notice that there's generally four points on the piece. And those four points represent the four directions that men would go to search for food and knowledge, my wisdom. And they bring it back to the community and offer it also to help nourish us all. So um, those are the basic design and shape elements of these pots. Mm -hmm. So on the top there, you know, as far as the tattoos and the glyphs on the, the incising, generally they're lines on the top, they're just straight lines or um, geometrical type things. That's more male than female. And then the bottom of the, on the females, uh, generally, you know, it's the small circles, you know, dots, uh, maybe lines, you know, not a lot, you know, it's just understated, but it's there. Um, and the paddle prints is really, where a lot of that is and the durability is important. So uh, yeah, there's a lot to think about when you're making them, but also what you're representing. Mm. And so we do have another question. So wonderful to see your beautiful work. I loved seeing your tools too. And, and so did I, I'm gonna tag onto that person's comment there, it was amazing. Could you speak more about the temper you use and how that helps the process. Right, well, um, traditionally we use a lot of um, shell as a temper for the, um, the range. And so that would be, you know, mussel, oyster, not so much quahog, but yeah, mussel, oyster, and clam shells. And there's no, no, no crab or lobster. Uh, they, they, they just don't work in the clay. Mm. Um, but that's the temper that I use. Um, I'm gonna try it. So these are, of course, you recognize they're ice cream sticks, but I carved the both ends of them so that to leave different impressions. So, um, yeah, um, you get really busy. Oh, here's the, the little hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I have a question. What would you say to someone uh, like myself who has difficulty drawing? I tried um, making a pot and coming up with, you know, the pattern, but also I cannot draw. I've tried, I get so discouraged. But so what 
what advice would you give to someone who maybe would love to work with this in that way, but just doesn't have the ability to draw? Yeah, I think you should have some stamps. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you had some of these, you can make wonderful impressions. Uh, beautiful patterns is endless. Um, just touching, 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 all the way around, or mm -hmm. dragging along. It, it, that that takes away. It's very seldom that I do freehand drawing on the spots. Um, even when I was talking about this, this bone one, um, I still I might start drawing a line, and then I'll go, "Why not?" Instead of draw the line, just roll the line. <laughs> You know, yeah. and so it just, it's really, so that's my answer, Crystal. Get some stamps, make some, or have someone make some for you. That sounds like a good but, idea. <laughs> I'm encouraged to give it one more try. <laughs> I'm trying to find my, I'm trying to find my niche uh, in the art world. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from anyone else? Well, Ramona, it was, this was just wonderful. I really am, um, I just am really, really touched by everything that you said. Um, just make sure I didn't miss anyone. Thank you for the, thanking you for the event. It was inspiring and healing. Um, so I wanna say thank you again again, indeed, for preserving such a rich history and for sharing that. And you really are a very gifted um, artist. Indeed, I love the part that you just made that you showed us. But when you got up to move, we saw from the picture, you said you had the one in the background that right. was in the corner. And so now I could gain the appreciation for the actual size of that part. They, in the pictures, they look small, but you're really doing yeah. amazing work so thank you for that and i want to say thank you also to you the viewers who've joined us today um obviously we can't have successful presentations without an audience as well so thank you um i would like to make um this notice to put this in your mind so we would like to also recognize that ramona peters is this year's lifetime achievement awardee for Tomaquag's annual honoring. Um, so thank you for that and um, congratulations for that. She is being recognized for her outstanding lifetime of work, empowering the native community through advocacy, historic preservation, environmental justice and art. So you can join us for this year's honoring, learn more and purchase your tickets on our website. I'd also like to invite you all back for next month's Culture Bear pres presenter. Those details will also be on our website. Uh, we are working on that presentation for September. And if you're interested in more cultural programming, Tamaquag offers a large variety of tours, visiting museum educator services, virtual presentations, workshops, professional development, and more. You can learn more on our website, give a call or send an email to discuss options. In this presentation today, along with any other, with, along with many others, excuse me, will be available on our YouTube page. So be sure to circle back and share this with your family and friends. And once again, we'd like to thank our funders at the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, Rhode Island Charge, the Pepito Opportunity Connection, the New England Foundation for the Arts, and other generous funders and donors like you. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation to the Tomaquag Museum. You can also support local Indigenous artists by shopping and sharing our online store, a branch of our program for Indigenous empowerment. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you again, Ramona, for being with us. And we hope to see you all again next month. Wani Kisak, have a good afternoon. <laughs>